Um, so for the, the this leads really well uh, since uh, Andrew was just presenting the uh, partition communication library uh, work uh, into a uh, tutorial on MPI partition communication. Now, this is going to be a little bit different than a regular tutorial in that this is a micro tutorial. So um, we're not going to be here for hours and we're not going to uh, actually guide you through a specific exercise. We will have an exercise and some example code to show you um, at the end that's meant to be done uh, after the presentation. So um, just for the sake of keeping it short, um, we're, we're just going to go through some exercises and this will all be available for folks later. If you want to copy, um, just let me know and I'm happy to do that. Um, We'll, we'll probably post these slides afterwards too on the uh, on the website. So if you just want to follow the slides, that's fine. If you want anything else that's in here, like the code and that sort of stuff, you let me know. All right. So I'm going to co-present this uh, partition communication tutorial with Matthew Dosange. Um, he, he's also with me here at Sandia National Laboratories. We've been working on uh, code for partition communication and the specification for a very long time. So he's going to talk about um, how to put together some basic applications with it as well. Um, so the goal out of this tutorial is that I'm hoping that you can take away uh, for those of you who are teaching uh, what you would want to teach and some key takeaways from partition communication. Uh, and for those of you who are simply talking to application developers and still sort of teaching them what they need to do, um, takeaways as to what you would point them to do, um, how to basically structure a partition communication type application uh, and some performance uh, interesting information that you would want to relate to them to make sure that their code ends up being very performant with this mode as well. So, um, you know, wh why do you even want partition communication? Um, it, it's more about the fact that we need to be able to leverage a whole bunch of threads in MPI. And traditionally, this has all been done with thread multiple and just traditional MPI sends. Um, part of the problem with this is that you get a lot of messages that go through uh, MPI as a whole, and this has quite a little bit of overhead with it. I'll show you some actual numbers from the overhead later. Um, but basically what we want to do is try to sidestep this. We also want to be able to uh, let MPI move data whenever it's available, um, not when uh, we have done a complete, say, if we want to talk about threads, a uh, fork, we're going to do a whole bunch of work, we're going to do a join, and then traditionally you would do the MPI communication after the join uh, when you do a single large MPI send, for instance. Um, so, out of this, uh, w when we start looking at how many MPI processes that we have on a single node, uh, we might get a lot of these, right? And when we spin up separate instances of the MPI library, that also takes main memory as well. So, in the future, if you care about your total overall memory usage, which we may because of high-speed uh, memory technologies that have limited capacity on die, uh, you want to make sure that you can sort of uh, create these extra threads and use them efficiently with MPI. So where are all these sources of concurrency coming from? Um, originally, if you'd been talking to me five years ago, I would have told you stuff like many core architectures. I just want to point out here that, um, you know, current CPUs are what we used to consider many core, right? If you, if you looked at Knight's Landing, which is the Xeon Phi, um, you know, we thought that was very many core. It had 61, 68 cores on it, right? And, and now you're looking at 56 core Xeon and Epic type CPUs, right? So our traditional CPUs have already become many core architectures in a lot of ways. Um, and so we're just going to continue adding new cores and new generations. And so we're going to have to deal with this somehow. Um, things about uh, how we integrate with OpenMP, um, how we can work with those types of threading uh, models for what we'll show you here. It's going to be mostly OpenMP centric, but there's no reason why this can't be uh, extrapolated to other threading models as well. That was the goal is to make it very general. And then the idea of GPUs. So, you know, we have thread blocks, we have individual threads on GPUs. There's tons and tons of threads. They're not as capable as a traditional CPU thread either. Um, but how do we manage all these different parts of, of concurrency? And so the goal of partition communication is to try to help solve these problems. So when your application developers, your students come to you and say, you know, hey, how do I use MPI with these new uh, models that I need to use for my GPU or my CPU. Um, how does this work efficiently? What's the best way to do it? Um, you can answer them with some partition communication code. Uh, there we go. 
sorry about that. Okay, so so this is part of um, some work that we did a while ago uh, about decomposing a 3D stencil. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. There's 2D and 3D. Blue line here is a 2D stencil. The um, orangey type line is a 3D stencil here. Um, but when you start decomposing these things and having many threads in an MPI process, basically what we end up doing is increasing our average time to drain the queue, which is your y-axis there, um, depend on, depending on how we decompose things with uh, many, many threads. Uh, and what that gray box up at the top is, is a uh, time limit for molecular dynamics code. So if you looked at something like Gromax or LAMPS today and how they do uh, molecular dynamics, to get the amount of simulated nanoseconds that they want in a day, uh, they need to be able to have a specific uh, iteration time for each step of the simulation, which is typically one picosecond. Um, and in this case, uh, the everything above that gray box is exceeding those timelines for what we consider a modern molecular dynamics code to be performant at. Um, so what you can see here is just draining a queue when you have many, many, many messages from a single MPI process uh, can take longer than the entire budget for compute and communication that you have in a modern molecular dynamics code. Um, so partition communication is really trying to solve some of these issues as well and avoid overheads rather than just going to traditional threads. Um, so the basic concepts here, and Andrew touched on some of these in the previous presentation, so I'm not going to go into as much detail. The idea basically is that you have many actors or threads contributing to a larger operation of MPI, but it's just a single operation, right? So if you consider operations, um, we have the same number of messages or operations today. That's the goal, right? So you had an MPI send in the past. You have an MPI partition communication that corresponds with that send. That partition communication might end up calling P ready and chunking things up into smaller portions. But the overhead that MPI has to have in terms of matching it and uh, processing that message is only equivalent to that operate and the number of operations. So we don't want any more new operations. Um, and basically the idea is many different actors, I'll call them threads here, but these can be different types. For example, it might be a thread block in a GPU, uh, can work together to assemble a message. So MPI only has to manage knowing when completion happens. So all we really need to do inside MPI is create counts. So we understand where, uh, when buffers are complete. Um, we, MPI gets a little bit more information than this. Um, so you can do something more sophisticated than just counting up the number of times P ready is called, but fundamentally at the lowest level, that that's what we're trying to do here is basically triggering it looks a lot like communication triggering as it happens in your hardware. Um, if your hardware supports that, and it's a very persistent style, right? So it's right now it's an init start test wait free. Um, and you can do this start test wait cycle, uh, that's in the brackets there multiple times over and over and over again. Um. And we don't have to do any massive concurrency overheads and, and complicated packing of data and send structures and stuff like that when they become available. So you can tell your users, or if you're doing the application yourself, uh, that you might not need to do pack and unpack like you designed it previously. Uh, the idea here is that you're sending data when it becomes available. Uh, and I'll show you that with this new type of overlap, um, basically because we can actually move data around, can people see my pointer? I'm assuming you can. Um, but I'm pointing at the thread. Yes, we can. Okay, thanks, Wesley. Um, so uh, since we can, when threads arrive at their P-ready calls, basically say, hey, my data portion is available, we can transfer data right away in the partition send timeline. Uh, the idea here is that you might be a little bit less efficient at packing your data than what you do in a traditional single threaded timeline, right? So all these threads arrive, we join back together and we do a single thread call that transfers all this data. Right, but we've probably in between here done some sort of pack and at the end on the receive side, we're doing an unpack because we're collecting structures together and we're moving data around. Um, we might not do that and consequently you might end up sending more data in your partition communication code. That's okay because the idea is that you're sending it not all at once at the critical point of performance for your application when you absolutely have to push the data through. So if you spend send a little bit more data in here, but you spend uh, you're just consuming time that was overlapped anyways, you might be able to do that and still get really good performance out of it. So that would be my first suggestion out of this would be don't worry as much about packing and unpacking your data as you would in a traditional code 
um, try that unpacked solution first. Tell your app people to do that or try that first. Um, and see what kind of performance that you get out of it. Cause you might be able to get really good performance with it, with a reasonable overlap on your system and your system characteristics uh, are going to dictate a few of these elements, right? Um, how much noise exists in the system and whatnot. Um, so particularly noisy system might be able to tolerate a little bit more of this, uh, but in general, you want to try to make your communication as efficient as possible but you might not need to pack it and you might be able to send a bit more uh, data and still get better results. Um, so first pass is that, then optimize for total volume that you're sending afterwards if it doesn't give you the performance results you want. Um, so persistent partition buffers uh, basically expose buffer uh, to MPI. There's a single piece of all of them. Uh, so, and all the partitions are of equal size right now. This makes programming a lot easier than creating uh, basically V or W versions. If you want to think about them that way, you could think about partition communication in the future of an init V or an init W, where we could express these sort of IO vec relationships between different elements of data. Uh, but right now we try to chop them up into equally sized portions. Uh, this may mean that in some cases for some codes where you need to send variable sizes, you may need to select your partition and your overall buffer size for that sort of largest message that you might send. So I know some applications that will send things like 16, 18 kilobytes and also send 22 and 24 kilobyte messages. Um, in that case, you might want to set your partitions to 24 kilobytes. You could even at the beginning of your partition indicate how long it was if you wanted. So you could interpret it on the other end. These aren't typically common applications that do this, but if you wanted to do something like that, that's how you could do it today. Um, so the idea here is that once you've created this buffer, P ready gets called the number of times equal to the number of partitions. Um, and that will then be followed by a tester weight, which we'll show you some code for this in, a, in a, just a second. So you can try it out for yourself. Um, and that's how we're going to make all of this work today. Um, so the idea of ideally each thread would call this one time, but there's no restriction whatsoever on what calls be ready um, for all of these things. Um, but basically underneath the covers, what we can do is some atomic fetch and adding. So if you're thinking about the implementation itself underneath, um, that's probably what we're going to be doing in the application itself, uh, in the library, MPI library itself. So here's an example of some code on how to use M partitioned MPI. We'll get into a real code that you could actually copy paste and compile uh, a little bit later in the tutorial. Um, but this is the basic idea. So like a persistent communication code, you set up the operation first. So you do an init. There's all the function, the, the inputs that you need to put with it. You start the request. So MPI start on the request. And then after that, you add items to the buffer. So you call P ready for each partition uh, associated with the request. And you do it many, many, however many times for the number of partitions you have. Then after you've done that, you can wait on it or test your choice, right? Uh, test for completion of the request. And then you can do the start over again and come back and do this loop over and over again. Eventually you're going to free it when you're done with it. Um, so the, the flow is very, very similar to persistent communications. The difference is that you have this call in the middle that you need to call partition number of times. It's erroneous to go off and, um, uh, wait in a manner that P ready can no longer be called. Um, so you can go through and actually wait on something, even though all the P readies haven't been called yet. Um, but, uh, but you have to ensure that they will be called. So how do you actually use this thing in a program? Some best practices that we found from our experience, actually programming these into real apps. Um, what you really want to try to aim for here out of partition communication is matching the parallelism and the computation of the data structures to the partitioning of your communication. So in a lot of ways, like I said before, with pack and unpack, um, matching more to the native data structures and moving them around in those formats uh, can be very helpful in these cases uh, as that data becomes available. So think about this in terms of if you had a standard Halo exchange, Halo exchange, just exchanges all with neighbors. Think about it as like a 3D halo exchange. Think about it as a die. And each face of the die 
has data that it needs to pass to the other neighbor packed into a larger cube, for instance. Um, so the idea here is that you would have each face portions of it will become available and you want to send those as soon as they do become available um, so that the other side can use those and start computing with them uh, as soon as possible as well. So you get a bit more overlap and less synchronous behavior uh, with partition communication and that you have more overlap opportunities, but you're still going to do that uh, main synchronization on each loop through because, of course, you can't start the next partition communication until you've waited on the previous one being complete. Um, so the idea here is that you want to balance your communication granularity with your overlap potential. Uh, so the idea here is not too small of a message, but not too large of a message either. Um, now, current networks versus future networks. If I tell you how to do this today, current networks suggest today about 64 kibibytes to single meta, uh, megabytes are good targets for total buffer size with when you're trying to chop it up into 32 to 64 bit partition, uh, 32 to 64 partitions of data. So what's that really telling you? It's telling you that probably if you have individual threads, you're doing individual p readies on them, somewhere between one kilobyte to 64 kilobyte partition size of your overall buffer is probably the sweet spot. Um, it could be, remember, this could be a much, much, much larger message, right? What I'm saying here is that if you've got that typical 32 to 64 actor thread ish, um, situation, you want to try to aim for those individual partitions to be somewhere between 1 to 64 kibibytes. Um, if you have something that's, you know, gigabytes long, still try to aim for chopping up your data into that size of data best for individual sends to get the best performance. Um, outside of that range, it's not going to be bad. It's just this is sort of the sweet spot. If you can get it in there, um, that's that's what you should do. And I should make a note here, too, that in future systems, this will quite a bit widen the range of good partition size choices because um, there will be hardware supports that we can use um, in future systems to trigger these things so that there will be a larger choice of size. But it will never make this sort of sweet spot of you know individual partition of data somewhere between 1 to 64 kibibytes is still going to be good, a really great point for uh, uh, for performance. So you can tell your apps folks or when you're putting together the app yourself, you want something in that range probably. Um, and, and think about very much at your application development. We program them for years and years and years that if you have threads or you have an accelerator kernel or something like that, never, ever, ever run MPI from it, right? Um, We've taught them that you should put it outside of parallel regions. MPI shouldn't be called in parallel. We've taught them that uh, you you might want to put in tests every once in a while. You might want to call into MPI with tests just to make sure that progress is happening. And we've taught them this sort of stuff uh, of uh, of best practices to get the best performance out of them. Uh, so if you are teaching new folks, please don't teach them that necessarily. Um, and if, if you're talking with your application folks, you're going to have to sort of reprogram them a little bit. Okay. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, the MPI library underneath is, is going to try to do some aggregation, probably a high quality implementation. It's going to try to help you out with your, um, with your, your uh, overlap. So the idea is here, send early and often. Um, and, and don't send super, super small partitions just because of the function call overhead right now. We'll slow things down. Um, so I'll go very, very quickly through some optimizations because I want the remainder of the time to be on the application themselves. But the idea basically is that we can subdivide um, larger buffers. We can send the data when it's ready. The idea is that we reduce the total number of messages sent and matching overheads from a partition communication section as a whole. We can also aggregate things together inside the library to help you out. Okay, so very, very quickly. Um, this is the difference between basically all the threads being perfectly in sync and them being out of sync somewhat. I just wanted to show you some graphs here that if you're perfectly, perfectly in sync, um, the message size where partition communication makes sense is a little bit higher from our particular uh, experiments. Um, if you have more noise, um, when we have, this is total buffer size, remember. We have total buffer size with 32 threads. All these are 32 thread results. Um, you know, we're hitting these sweet spots in exactly the range that I told you before. When you break them down, these are 1 to 64 kibibyte partitions 
of a you know four to sixteen megabyte buffer. The partition, the individual partition size is more important than the total buffer size, as we found out. Um, so compared with single send and multi send, this green line fine points you'll see, um, which is partition communication, is the spike where we see the best performance out of these things. Um, multi send is literally doing uh, MPI sends from each one of the cores. So keep in mind that on a particular system, the general range that I gave you is 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 a, a good guide. Um, we found typically in our production systems, we're somewhere between two to four percent of noise is fairly typical. Um, never under one percent, so you never really get to this zero percent case unless somebody's doing some weird tests that they show you these types of results. And ten percent is a pretty extreme amount of noise. Uh, but this is where MPI multi send starts coming in and becoming a factor. So you can tell them that yes, multi sending, so doing many different sends from each individual thread can give you some boosts, but you need quite a bit of uh, offset and overlap time to be able to catch up with the partition communication. So in the range that they'll normally be operating, partition communication is probably the best choice for them. So now, uh, Wesley, can you unmute Matthew, please? Uh, can you hear me? We can, Matthew. Okay, awesome. Okay, so uh, this is based upon a benchmark. This is a, an example chart that we came up with uh, that is oh, we're using to test our uh, open MPI implementation. Um, but uh, basically, the snippet of code show or there's gonna be like about four snippets of code to note here. Um, similarly to how you do uh, persistent send and receive, you have to uh, create a request uh, depending upon your range. Uh, do the same init, but there's an extra uh, variable here. If you look at thread part for this particular example, that's the number of partitions. So this looks very similar to uh, an MPI send init with the, or even an S or an I send, uh, but with the addition of this uh, number of partitions that are of, uh, I should say that that should be the num threads. Uh, and the thread part is how many uh, elements per partition. So in this example, we're creating uh, one partition per thread. Um, and this is just the general setup for our benchmark, which is going to try and compute um, perceived bandwidth, which uh, the numbers we, that were shown earlier is uh, the metrics which we use to evaluate this. So, so maybe we should... Yeah, why don't you go ahead. Sure people what that is. Okay, so uh, perceived bandwidth. The idea behind perceived bandwidth, if we could go back to that uh, diagram real quick. Sorry, Ryan. Uh, actually, I was thinking the, the diagram with uh, the uh, thread arrivals. So when trying to compare these two, uh, we need a metric that encapsulates uh, what the application will see as bandwidth. So in the second model, uh, from the point at which all threads have arrived, uh, we would normally calculate bandwidth from there to the send completion. Uh, if we used the same metric of like starting where data starts transferring to the end of uh, the completion. So from when thread one's arrival to the partition to send completion, uh, we'd be timing the overlap. And so we try to create or try to create a benchmark that uh, encapsulated the uh, idea of bandwidth given that we don't want to count this overlap. So that's from the end of thread four's arrival to uh, the partition send completion. Yeah, so yeah. basically, if you try to take this, these 
four transfers here and crunch them into the time between here and here, how fast would your network have to be to actually do that? Um, and it takes into account all of the stuff that was sent previously. Um, so this example is sort of an example of uh, this code here. If you can compile it and ran it in your local uh, machines, you could get an idea of how fast it will be for your users uh, of, well, what could I actually take advantage of here? Um, how fast will people could perceive the network to be compared with their traditional uh, way of uh, doing their MPI sends and receives? Uh, it's also worth noting here, so the last couple lines uh, start to do this setup where we have uh, two sleep times, uh, one for uh, how much the standard thread's going to sleep for, which is uh, indicative of, or trying to emulate uh, computation to some degree. And then the sleep plus, which is a single laggard thread that uh, adds some amount of noise to the system. Um, should we get to the next slide? Okay, so this is the uh, how the initial part of our setup for the uh, uh, parallel region. Um, in particular, the things to note here are, uh, so we've already done the inits. Um, we have to call MPI start from uh, the master thread or um, a single thread. So, because that's still the only part of the uh, partition communication that can happen in parallel is the P ready call or uh, potentially a P arrived call. Um, but uh, we set up everything here. We set the sleep timers. Uh, and for uh, the entire, or the number of iterations in the benchmark, we start um, do a thread barrier so no uh, for, or P ready can happen before the MPA start is called. Uh, if we did it at the next slide. Uh, we do the uh, required sleeps on each of the thread to emulate computation. And then each thread individually calls uh, MPIP ready. Um, from there, uh, we have another block here that starts waiting for a single uh, thread to arrive. This is a basically a rudimentary implementation of what you'd think of as MPI P arrived any. Uh, where it just loops over the uh, number of partitions and tests each individual one. Um, and from there, we wait for, or once a single one is uh, arrived, we uh, wait for the rest of them to uh, uh, we wait on the entire request to be finished. Um, this is different from the numbers you see above in the sense that we wanted to test P arrived in this particular version. Uh, the benchmark we used for the previous numbers uh, started timing at when the first thread uh, or when the last thread finished. Um, yeah, so in the typical tutorial, we would have asked you how you could possibly time the entire time that you had of overlap. And this is how you get overlap timing. Right. Um, from there, that's the entirety of the loop. Um, the last slide of this uh, just uh, shows our computation of how everything's called. You do the same MPI request free that you would normally do. Um, and that is basically how you create a uh, 
benchmarked for perceived bandwidth in or with uh, the MPI partition communication. Okay, so if anybody's interested in that code, obviously these uh, slides will be up later. Uh, and uh, if anybody's interested in more complicated versions of uh, the work we've done with applications and whatnot, um, well, I'm, I'm happy to go through some of that stuff as well uh, in offline discussion. If you're interested, you can leave a message in the uh, in the Slack afterwards for the tutorial, and we'll uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, but basically, the trick out of this too is figuring out when you do want to do partition communication, how you partition up that computation that's having and happening in the threads, and relate it to the communication that's happening. A lot of this is taking the communication code, looking at the computation code, and overlapping these two things. Um, it helps quite a bit to have the application developers walk through this with you when you're when you're helping them, uh, so that you can understand which structures need to be transferred and whatnot. Um, that's typically the longest portion that we've had when we're adapting these codes, and it typically takes you know uh, two to four weeks, depending on the com complexity of the of the code, uh, to get a good solid revision uh, working for a larger application code. Um, for this type of uh, uh, micro benchmark and stuff like this, that's meant to be done in an hour or two during a tutorial to give you an idea of how long this stuff takes to think through and write down. Um, so we're, we're a couple of minutes over, so we'll do some final takeaways. Uh, partition communication is really useful for all your concurrent programming models. So. Um, if you're thinking about doing code like this, or you want to teach code like this in your class, or your application developers at your institution uh, want to be able to do this together, this is a good thing to uh, introduce to them. Uh, and remember that the idea here is that you're sending da data close to the computation. It is not a fork join send model like a traditional uh, thing you would suggest. Uh, and I wanted to point out very much for those that don't pay attention to the forum, uh, this is going to be much more useful for accelerators and GPUs with some of the uh, performance optimizations we're bringing in in MPI 4.1 uh, to allow us to make sure that GPU uh, buffers are available as, before you ever start a P-Ready. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so keep this in mind when people ask you how you're going to do GPUs in, in future MPI versions. This is a really good programming model for them. Uh, to be able to do things. Uh, so with that, I won't go into too much detail with these, but we'll post the <coughs> excuse me, we'll post the slides with it. If you'd like a longer discussion of this and more explanation, we also have a portion of a YouTube video from MPI Forum where we go quite into detail about uh, how this kernel module would work for 4.1, how you would do uh, GPU programming with things like PSync that you've heard mentioned today as well, and why those things are good ideas. And I'd be happy to point you to that. It's about 45 minute discussion. Um, so, with that, thank you. Uh, I know we don't have a ton of time left, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. See, mm -hmm. Wesley, can I figure out how to? Oh, yeah, hold on. I'm going to stop I sharing think... so that I can <laughs> sure. yeah. I see if anybody's raising their hand. Coming out on the Slack channel, I'm not sure. Mm, looks like perhaps not. Okay, so, of course, we're going to information. It. If people want to ask questions afterwards on the Slack channel, we'll be there all day if you wanted to talk with us or uh, connect with us for more detailed information. All right. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Well, thanks, Wesley.